Hello, my name is Dave Janone, and I'd like to welcome you to the Sunday morning worship service of the Victorville United Methodist Church and the Barstow United Methodist Mission. We hope you enjoy their service and that you want to share these videos with friends and family. All our videos can be found on our Facebook page, United Methodist Church of Victorville. You can also find them on our YouTube channels, Victorville United Methodist or First United Methodist of Bar Barstow. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the service. So glad to see you. You caught me reading my Bible this morning. In fact, it's this week's scripture passage. I'll read part of it to you. I'm on uh, Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Mm, following Jesus, that sounds like a great idea. The disciples were able to follow Jesus. They got to be with him while he was on the earth. They got to see him when he went to go pray with our God, his father. They got to see him feed people who were hungry and heal people who were sick. They got to see him calm people who were scared. They really got to see what it meant to follow Jesus and love people like he loved them. But Following Jesus now, that might seem a little hard, but I bet we can do it. Let's practice first with trying to follow me. It reminds me of a game I used to play when I was little, follow the leader, or maybe you've played Simon Says. So we're gonna do something together, but I'm gonna be the leader and you're gonna follow me. So the first one, I'm just gonna do this and you need to do it with me. Well, that was super easy. Let's do one a little harder. Mm. This time, I'm not gonna talk 
and you are just going to be my mirror. That means we're not going to talk to each other, but we're going to do the same thing. So watch and follow. That one wasn't too bad, right? How'd you do? Well, let's do one more. This time, I know I'm not going to talk and I want you to close your eyes. Ready to follow me? Close your eyes. Okay, open your eyes. How'd you do the last time? It was a bit tricky, wasn't it? It's hard to follow somebody if you can't see them, like if you don't know them. How do you follow them and do what they do? It's hard to follow somebody that you really don't know. So how do we get to know Jesus? The disciples were lucky they got to walk with him. How do we get to know Jesus? Well, one way we can get to know Jesus is to read the Bible. It says exactly what he said and what he did. And it even reminds us of what we need to do. Another way is to spend time with him. You need to spend time in prayer, a quiet time every day, perhaps in the morning before you get busy doing all sorts of other things that we need to get done. Sometimes we're busy doing what we want to do and we forget to check with God first and his son Jesus to see what they need us to do. So find some quiet time and you can pray with our Lord and you can listen too. We don't always want to do all the talking. Sometimes we just need to listen and let him speak to our hearts so we know what it is that he'd like us to do. So in the morning, make sure you have breakfast. You want to do that because that helps give your body what it needs for the day, it gives you energy. But don't forget to have breakfast with Jesus. <laughs> you want to also feed your heart, your mind, and your soul. So read your Bible, spend some time in prayer, and then you can follow Jesus too, just like he asked us to. See you next time. The scripture today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From this time on, Jesus began to say plainly to his disciples, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer much from the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. I will be put to death, and on the third day I will be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid it, Lord, he said. This must never happen to you. Jesus turned around and said to Peter, Get away from me, Satan. You are an obstacle in my way, because your, these thoughts of yours are men's thoughts, not God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to come with me, he must forget himself, carry his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his own life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Will a man gain everything if he wins the whole world, but loses his life? Of course not. There is nothing a man can give to regain his life. For the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will repay everyone according to his deeds. Remember this, there are some here who will not die until they have seen the Son of Man come as King. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hi, I'm Pastor Carrie, and it's so good to be together again. I hope you enjoy this message and that you can learn a little bit about Matthew here and Peter and all the other things that are involved in this passage. For me, well, this passage seems to be teaching us about the fact that we all need a reality check at some point in our lives. This is a turning point in the gospel, and it seems to indicate that we have to make a serious effort, like Jesus is doing here, to get a grasp of how to be disciples and how to be the church. I remember many reality check talks we had as missionaries when we worked for a hunger agency. 
we had talks with many different families and groups about the work and responsibility and all the resources that it took to keep a heifer alive and healthy and able to reproduce offspring and provide milk and cheese. We had to help families have a reality check before they received the cow so that they knew how much work and responsibility it was going to take. Too many just wanted the cow so they could have a barbecue. So we had to help each family create a plan. And if they did not follow the plan, we had to take the cows away and give them to a family that was going to take the time and do the chores and provide the food and a clean pen. The idea was to create a new future that would break the cycle of poverty into a lifetime of providing for their family from their own labors and livelihood of raising dairy cows. And our own reality check in the work that we were doing was identifying the truly dedicated families. You'd think everybody would be, but we had to identify the dedicated families who wanted to be free of poverty and were able to do the work. We found out that we had to try and avoid the families who were just looking for a short-term solution. So making sure that people really understood what they were committing to helped us to do our work better. What our hunger agency had to offer was much more than a quick fix. It was a life-changing experience. Have you ever had that kind of experience when maybe a relationship didn't work out because the people involved had very different understandings of what the outcome was going to be. Many times that happens with our children. They sometimes want things that we cannot afford and they just do not understand why. So we have to have that reality check talk with them and teach them about the value of money and how we actually earn it. As Matthew describes the scene, Jesus has just praised and blessed Peter for recognizing him as the Messiah. Then Jesus begins to show his disciples that the Messiah must undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes be killed, and on the third day, be raised. This is the point in the story where Jesus sets us straight and gives us a reality check on what it really means to be a dedicated disciple or church. Now, the disciples' vision of what was to happen was born out of centuries of waiting on the Messiah to arrive and then refined over the three years while following Jesus they thought they would, he would lead them in some kind of revolution and overthrow the Roman oppressors. They had seen his miracles and witnessed firsthand his charismatic ability to draw adoring crowds. They had heard his, him proclaim aloud the arrival of the new kingdom. He was their long-awaited future. The reality check that was just barely sinking into their hearts was that this Messiah that they thought was going to save them was really going to surrender without a fight into as a common criminal's death. You know the story. Peter worried again about what he just heard tries to dissuade Jesus from his bizarre prediction about what would happen in Jerusalem. And Jesus, in what might be the sharpest and most surprising rebuke in all of scriptures, puts Peter in his place with one swift stroke. Get behind me, Satan. It is as if Jesus places a star on Peter's forehead, and in the same moment, he grabs it right back. When 
Jesus then turns to his leaders, he puts the essence of his gospel message clearly right before them. If any of you really want to use my name and call yourselves believers in what I am all about, let me be clear. You are going to have to give up your selfish ways. Start putting others first and be God's love in the world. Be a light of hope to the world. Jesus was focused not just on one small revolution, but on a great revolution for all disciples, all churches, for all time. Jesus took the time to have this reality check with his disciples. And thank God that he did. After all these years, we are now facing some of the biggest challenges that we have as Christians. And I believe that that reality check that Jesus had way back then was necessary for us to even have a glimpse of hope today. Because God's love is serious business. And we know this today more than we have in a long time. We question ourselves if we are the kind of disciple and if we are the kind of church that can stand up for others in the context of police brutality, white supremacy, racial injustice, and gross economic inequality. Are we the kind of disciples and are we the kind of church that can stand up for others in the context of global warming, mass extinction, droughts, and heat waves? Are we the kind of disciples and are we the kind of church that can stand up for others in the context of fires destroying forests and whole towns right here in California? What does it mean to be a disciple and a church in today's world of multi-million dollar industries that drive us to deny our mortality through cosmetic surgery, fashion rules, the belief that success in life is equ equated to leisure, entertainment, real estate, sports cars, and the belief that money can buy you happiness? What? Does it mean to be a disciple and a church in a culture that glorifies violence but cheapens death? What does it mean to be a disciple and a church in a global corporate economy that destroys and steals the life out of our planet instead of wisely protecting it with gentleness and care? so future generations can enjoy the beauty of nature. What would Jesus say to our frightened hearts that prioritize self-protection over all else that matters in this life? What would it look like in this time and place to lay down our fears so that others might live? What kind of disciple willingly sets aside their own interests so that they can prioritize what Jesus calls the great commandments to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves? To take up a cross as Jesus did is to stand always in the center of the world's pain, knowing that we are not standing alone. We stand with Jesus. And this is how we can give away that selfish inclination to the wind. And the wind of the Holy Spirit will take a hold of us once and for all. Not just to glimpse in the general direction of suffering and then look away, but to intentionally exist there because that is where you will find our loving God. When you stand with Jesus, you identify yourself with those who are aching and weeping and screaming and dying. You insist that your comfort isn't comfort 
unless the least and the lost can share it with you. You know taking up the cross means you see our crucified Lord reflected in every suffering soul that surrounds us and pouring our energies and our lives into alleviating their pain. That is what it means to be the church. When you truly stand with Jesus at his side, you accept against all the lies of our culture that you will die. Because you stand with Jesus, your relationship with him gives you the means to follow up on that courageous acceptance of your own mortality with the most important question you can ask yourself. How will I spend this short-lived, singular, God-given life on earth? Will I, like Peter, be pushed to believing in selfishness and in doing so push Jesus away? And here's the bottom line. Jesus died. And not only that, Jesus died the unjust, humiliating death of the wrongly accused. He declared solidarity for all time with those who are abandoned and colonized and oppressed and accused, imprisoned, beaten, mocked, and murdered. He took an instrument of torture and turned it into a sign of acceptance and unity for all people everywhere. He loved, and he loved, and he loved all the way to the end. And then he came back with the gift of love to empower you and me to carry on. I think that Jesus rebukes Peter so sharply in this week's gospel precisely because the temptation Peter holds on to is so appealing, so deceptive and so devious that it convinces him and us of the idea that you don't have to do the hard thing. You don't have to take this faith business so seriously. You don't have to give up your own rights and privileges and comforts. No, we don't. It's true. There are far Too many who have made Christianity into a spectator sport. It is a very popular version of Christianity, and it is happening all over with plenty of people deciding to live that way. And our biggest reality check is that this popular spectator version of Christianity is not the version that Jesus calls us to live. It does not create the disciples and the churches that Jesus commands us to be in the business of multiplying his church. The truth is, Jesus came to put right our relationship with God, and that meant changing the faith on the sidelines kind of relationship with God into a roll up your sleeves and get dirty kind of relationship with God. The irony of it all is that spectator version of Christianity will not grant us safety, immunity, joy, or blessing. It will not. Did you hear Jesus' words right? Those who save their lives will lose it. Those who lose their lives for my sake will save them. Give up your selfishness. The Canaanite mother did, but the rich young man couldn't. And he walked away from Jesus. That's the reality Jesus cleared up when he died and rose from the dead. Church isn't about saving yourself. You can't do that. God saves us. God saves Us when you give up your selfishness and let God take the wheel. Church is about setting that selfless example and helping others to 
Do just what you had to do. Give up that control. Hand it over to God and let Christ use you. That is the only way to reach the world of suffering souls with the transforming power of Christ's love. We see church happening every single week at our Marcy Mercy Market. We pull out the clothes and the food onto the parking lot and the grass and we freely hand out water and masks and prayers and we listen and we let Christ's love shine. Jesus told his disciples, if any want to be leaders in this cause of teaching God's love to a lonely, hurting world, then let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who like to live and give do the things that Jesus has taught them for his sake. They then will gain a whole new life. If COVID has taught us anything, it is that suffering is happening on all sorts of levels to everyone alike. We are all affected in different ways. And it is how we respond to this suffering that makes all the difference. So what if our reality check is Realizing that God's plan was to send Jesus to bear a word of redemption and grace and love, and the cross happened as a result. Remember that the light sent from God pierced through the world's darkness and exposed ill motives, hatred, gossip, greed, violence, and the like. Still, some people preferred the darkness over the light because their actions were dark. Another reality check is that the cross isn't something we choose, but rather it's something that finds us. Christ identifies with all of our suffering. He took it on himself in his suffering, and he promises to meet us in our suffering. What does take up your cross and deny yourself look like in this case? It means following Jesus' lead and to the best of our ability, making decisions and acting in ways that reflect God's love for us and all people. God's acceptance of us and all people. God's desire for abundant life for us and all people. Deny yourself is not the same as forget all about yourself and certainly not demean yourself. When you are ready to take the Jesus reality check, you realize God is in it for everyone, not just us. And that is really what denying yourself looks like. Denying your selfishness, seeing that you and I are part of something much bigger, in recognizing that there is, in fact, no meaningful you or I apart from us. When the selfishness is gone, we are filled with Christ's presence. Christ is present. Christ himself holding us lamenting with us, encouraging us, and promising us the strength to endure and having endured to flourish and flourishing to help others do the same. Give up your selfishness and take on our responsibility of living for God's sake, being God's love, God's hands and hearts, and help in this world bring God's love into this hurting world. Amen. Lord, I come 
I confess, but when here I find my rest, without you I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Oh, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. We hope you are blessed by this worship service and that it will inspire and comfort you today. If you have a prayer request, we would love to be in contact with you. And we would greatly appreciate any donations you're able to help to share with us. Your gifts help us continue this work. Our mailing address is VVUMC 15150 La Paz Avenue in Victorville, zip 92395 or Barstow United Methodist Mission, 404 East Mountain View Street, Barstow, zip 92311. You can also make your donation online at our website, vvumc.com. Thank you again for joining us today, and we pray you'll have a blessed week. <music>